said, it is not right nor reasonable that anybody should hear the gospel twice till everybody's at least heard it once. And yet over half of the world remains untold. Now before the close of the New Testament, the disciples and the early church evangelized the whole world twice. In other words, that don't mean everybody got saved. That means everybody got exposed to the gospel. But sadly today, Coke, Pepsi Cola does a much better job of getting their message out than the Christian church does they, theirs. Look at that first verse again. So little time, the harvest will be over. Our reaping done, we reapers taken home. Report our work to Jesus, Lord of harvest, and hope he'll smile and say, well done. Will he? If all we have done is accumulated stuff in this life for us. Now my question I started to ask you a while ago before we sing this verse. If you knew you're getting involved and you supporting the work of world evangelism through the local church missions, what keeps someone out of hell would you choose to do it? But yet, we buy stuff for ourselves. We buy our trucks and our cars and our home. Nothing wrong with having a nice place to live and a vehicle to drive. But when was the last time you gave up something so that someone could hear the gospel? Again, to quote Oswald J. Smith, he said this, because today, tonight, you will be given a commitment card at the end, at the end of the presentation tonight that you'll have a week to think over and pray about of what you will invest in missions over the upcoming year. Now this is above and beyond your tithes and offering. Sadly, many people never do anything for missions. Oswald J. Smith and the question was asked, how much shall I give? He gave four possibilities. He said, if I refuse to give anything to missions this year, I am practically, ca practically casting a ba ballot in favor of recalling all missionaries and stopping preaching the gospel. If I give less than I have before, I am favoring reduction of missionary forces. If I give the same as I formerly have, I favor holding the ground that we've won, but oppose any forward movement. My song, therefore, has become hold the fort, forgetting that the Lord never intended his army to take refuge in a fort, but we're all commanded to go. And then number four, he says, if I increase my offering before beyond what I have formerly, then I favor an advancement move, advanced movement in the conquest of new territory for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all gonna make a decision over the next week. And yet time is running out. How many of us believe that the Lord's return is getting mighty close? I know preachers have been saying that for generations, but can I tell you, all you have to do is look at the Bible and look at the signs and say it, it is close. Let's sing that first verse again, all right, before we get into the Word of God. So little time, the harvest will be over. Our reaping done, we reapers taken home. Report our work to Jesus, Lord of harvest, and hope he'll smile and that he'll say, well done. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us lost souls to win. Oh, then to save some dear ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sinner in. All right, let's get our Bibles and all stand together. Look on the back right corner of your bulletin. Though the covers be worn and the pages be torn and though places bear traces of tears, yet more precious than gold is this book worn and old that can shatter and scatter my fears. This old book is my guide, tis a friend by my side. It will lighten and brighten my way, and each promise I find soothes and gladdens my mind as I read it and heed it each day. 
To this book I will cling, of its worth I will sing, though great losses and crosses be mine. For I cannot despair, though surrounded by care, while possessing this blessing divine. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's get our Bibles out and turn to a very well-known portion of Scripture when it comes to world missions, Matthew, the 28th chapter. Now, we'll be back in our study on Matthew two weeks from today. Today, we're on missions. Next Sunday, we'll be on the home and family as we have our baby dedication Sunday. And then two weeks from today, we'll be back in Matthew chapter 23, where we were looking at the woes of Christ upon the religious leaders of his day. But today, we're going to be looking at the plan of God for missions. The plan of God for missions is the name of the message this morning. The plan of God for missions. What, how, what does God intend for us to do? Now, this is a very familiar, most of us could probably quote this portion of Scripture. The resurrection has taken place. And Jesus has met his disciples on a hillside that he told them about before he was ever crucified. And he shows up in verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. That word doubted is the Greek word, Greek word destazo, and it means to, to be divided, to be uncertain of. They weren't certain what was going on. Everything they, had, everything they had given their lives to for the past three and a half years was up in question now. They thought Jesus was going to set up an earthly kingdom. And yet they had seen him tried in a mockery of a trial. They had seen him be put on a cross and crucified and die there. They had witnessed his body being placed in an empty tomb and the stone rolled over the door and the Roman soldiers sealing that stone and keeping a guard over it. And yet they had also seen him in his resurrected body that night as they were in that upper room when he appeared in the middle of the room without the aid of opening the doors or windows. Now then, they are still uncertain. In the very final words of our Savior to his men are the words that are known as the Great Commission of Jesus Christ. Tragically, for many believers, it has become the great omission. And notice what Jesus said. To get rid of their divided doubts, Jesus came in verse 18 and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of of the world. Amen. Father, we ask your blessings now upon the reading and the preaching of your word. Father, this is a verse, this is a message, this is a exhortation that we have heard many times throughout our lives about the Great Commission. But Lord, make it fresh to us today. Rekindle the fires of evangelism in our hearts and in our ministry here in this church. Lord, let us not be able to sleep at night as long as we know of loved ones and friends and others that are in danger of eternal hellfire. Lord, let us not rest until they have been told. Let us not let up until they are told about Jesus Christ. Let us not withhold our giving. Lord, it takes all of it. It takes us getting involved. It takes us giving the money that you have given us. You didn't give it to us to hoard. You gave it to us that we might send people and go and get the gospel to the world. We pray that you would bless now in this time of, as we look at your word. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And you may be seated. It is time... And we're going to see this tonight even. 
in our presentation, it is time that we as born-again believers take a renewed look, a fresh look at how we are fulfilling the Great Commission. Can I tell you that merely going to church does nothing in getting the gospel to the world? If all we do is go and sit and take in a message and meet a few of the fellow believers, and then we go home, and it does not transform our lives, and it does not cause us to have a burden for the untold, then what point was it? Are we fulfilling a religious obligation? Is it a rit religious ritual, a duty that we do? How many times have we spoken to people and we say, well, do you attend church? Well, I know I should attend church. And I know I need to make my life better. I need to attend church. I want to tell you something. You don't attend church because you want to make your life better. You attend church because you're an obedient believer. You're an obedient Christian. And we're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. I go to church because I want to hear what God has to say from his word. I need the encouragement of fellow believers. I need the exhortation from the word of God. I need to know what God has to say to me and speak to me. I want to meet with fellow believers and worship the Savior whom we adore, who gave his all for us and died on the cross that I wouldn't have to die and go to hell. But if it does not try, if we go home the same as we came in, then it was really a worthless effort, was it not? When was the last time you shared the gospel? Now, especially among Baptist churches, we're big about exhorting people to be soul winners for Christ. And I'm all for winning people to Christ. But we've almost made it an endeavor as though it depends on me and it depends on you. I want you to know Jesus himself said if we're not, if he could raise up the rocks to cry out. I, the plan of Almighty God does not depend upon me. However, he allows me and he allows you the opportunity to get involved on his plan and help lay up rewards for ourselves in heaven. Amen? Amen. That's why. Now, I, would, I could stand here and tell you that the heathen in Kenya and the heathen in Zambia and the heathen in Peru and the heathen in Columbus will die and go to hell if you don't go tell them. Well, the good news is they, they have to be told the gospel. But I want to tell you something. If... God, ha God doesn't have to have Marty win. He can use anybody to get them the gospel. He just needs an obedient believer. And God could use angels, but he doesn't. Now, this is all introduction, so just hang on. Do you know the story in Acts chapter 10 of Cornelius, the unsaved Roman centurion who gave alms daily and prayed daily? And he was in the middle of his afternoon worship one afternoon and the angel of God appeared to him and said, Thy prayers and thine alms have come up for a memorial before God. God has heard you. But listen, that's not good enough to get you into his presence. So what you need to do, Cornelius, is you need to send down to Joppa to the house of one Simon the Tanner and ask for Peter. And he'll come and tell you what thou shouldest do. Now the truth is that angel knew more about the gospel message than Peter probably ever knew in his whole life. He was, he was there at the beginning of, of creation and he's seen it all, all throughout. He could have given Cornelius the gospel, but God doesn't use angels. He uses you and me. Amen. Amen. Can I tell you what we've done in Baptist churches? We've taken a, and we know and we've preached that everybody should be a soul winner, a winner of souls, but we understand that not very many people will be. And that's the shame. And we have come to the place to where we have made the elusive soul winner God's special forces unit. And preachers will talk about, well, there are my soul winners over there. Well, I want to tell you about everybody that I'm looking at this morning, everyone that's sitting here under the sound of this preacher's voice, everyone that names the name of Jesus Christ and calls themselves a child of the heavenly king, every one of us ought to be found faithfully winning people to Christ. 
and sharing the gospel. It is not a special forces unit in God's army. It is God's army. But we've done the same thing with missions and missionaries. We've turned missions into a plan. It's not a plan. It's a purpose. We've taken missionaries and made them some sort of God's special forces unit. Can I tell you, a missionary is a believer like anybody else. They just heard the call of God. They felt the tug of God in their heart and in their soul. And they may go to across town, but they may go across the sea. But it is for every one of us to be involved. When he read this verse that we read a while ago in this Great Commission, as we're getting ready to walk through it, he didn't assign that to the elite forces. He did not assign that to a few people. He signed it to the, and this is post-resurrection. It's after the resurrection. It's after the cross. He's as now introduced, and we know from John chapter 20, he had already brought the church into existence. He is talking to those that are, have helped Jesus Christ as a foundation, but he used those apostles, and he tells him, here's the plan now, from now on out throughout the ages until I come back. And that's what every believer is supposed to be, in do, be involved doing. It's not a preacher's responsibility. It's not a deacon's responsibility. It's not a Sunday school teacher's responsibility. It's not the evangelist's responsibility. It is not the missionary responsibility. It is all of our responsibility. Amen. And we can never expect God to bless this ministry, to bless our homes, to bless what we do until we get involved in making sure the untold become the told. Amen. Now let's look at our text. I want you to see, first of all, the emphasis of the commission. The emphasis of the commission is found in verse 19. What's that very first word? Go. Say it again. Go. Now, let me explain what that word means. It means to... Go. Anybody does not understand the word of go. That's what I thought. We all understand it, don't we? Now again, if he was speaking, now you say, well, he was talking to the 12 disciples there. Yes, he was. But we're going to see in verse 20, what were they to do? To teach others to do the same thing, who to teach others to do the same thing. And now two millennial later, here we are doing, trying to do the same thing. Now, let me just tell you this. The, the command is to go. Now, I will tell you the, what we have done. We have made the going an event. Go is not an event. Go is not a happening. Go is a process. It is the Greek word translated here. Together. It could literally be translated as you are going. That's the reason why I think we, and I understand why we have visitation nights in churches across our nation. I understand that. But in doing so, we have taken the emphasis off the real meaning of the word go in the Great Commission. And we've got, we go out one night a week. No, no, no. You are a believer 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When you get up in the morning, Monday morning to go to work, guess what you're supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be sharing the gospel all along the way. That's the reason why you should never walk out of, you should never walk out that you don't have some sort of gospel seed. You know what a gospel seed is? It's a track. Look, we have a rack full of them back here. You ought to have them so that as you go about your business during the day, when you stop and pay for your gas, you can give somebody, you say, well, I'll just pay for mine at the, uh, with my debit card. Leave a track on the pump. When you're going... I mean, people can tell when I've been down to the hospital, I've got, I've got a trail behind me, wherever I'm going. In the elevator going up, and in the elevator coming down, there's, there's tracks. I'm not saying that to brag on me. I'm just simply saying that I, I have to realize my job is not to be a believer on Sunday and maybe Wednesday. My, I'm a believer every day of the week, all day. And I, I live under the, under the divine command of the final words of my Savior on this planet. And the very first word that he passed on, that he told them to make sure that I found out, is the word go. He said, now guys, there's going to come generations after you. Make sure they know that they're to go and to do the same thing. The word go, as I am going. When was the last time you just simply gave out? See, people are scared to death. They say, I do not know how to share the gospel. Hey, listen. 
We could talk about everything else. We could talk about football games yesterday. We could talk about hunting, deer season hunting, open here in South Georgia last week, you know, and, and people could talk about that. They don't mind talking about that. Well, when it turns to spiritual matters, they get cold feet and frozen lips. Now, why is that? Because we have forgotten that it is not an option. You military people, your commander gives you an order. It is not an option. You are supposed to do it and do it well. Amen? Well, why should God, our commander-in-chief, expect any less from us? That word go. Folks, we, we have forgotten about it. And we have gotten to the place where we don't care if people go or not. We don't give toward it. We won't help toward it. We won't do anything to make certain that the unsaved... Listen, one of our missionaries, you're going to hear about him tonight, Brother Robert Mickey, serves in Kenya. He has ventured down to the D Democratic Republic of Congo. And God is doing a work there. You're going to hear about it tonight. It will thrill your soul. But see, the truth is, when I announce we're having a mission Sunday, you can mark it down. People, it's just like a prayer Sunday. People don't get excited about it. Now, if I announced a singing group going to be here next week, we would have this place packed out full. It's because our priorities are warped and they're out of whack. We have forgotten that the Great Commission is not sing, but it's go. That's right, that's right. Amen. Amen. I love singing. Amen. I enjoy singing. I enjoy playing the piano. I enjoy doing all of that. But that is not the Great Commission. The Great Commission is we are to go. And we ought to be more excited about Missions Conference and Mission Sunday than any time else of the year. It ought to be the place that we can pack it out. Amen. Now, some of you who've been here a long time know that used to be the truth. Missions conference was the best attended thing we had all year long. It's time to get back to that. Because last I checked, there's not less sinners on the earth. Last I checked, the gospel had not been rescinded or amended. Amen. Amen. But there are some even sitting here today, you can sit here and hear about your responsibility and yet go home and do nothing about it. Dereliction of duty. The word is go. That command to go. That's the emphasis of the command to go because nothing happens until we go. Now, why should we go? Let me give you a couple of thoughts. It proves we love Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you can quote it, say it with me. If you love me, keep my commandments. God says, evidence that I love him is that I obey him. Is that not right? If I don't, hello, is that right? Amen. If I don't obey him, that means I don't love him. Right. Now, I'm not up here giving you Marty Wynn's opinion. I'm telling you what God said. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, Keep my commandments. Let me give you another one. Turn to this one, please. John's other letter, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Let me tell you why so many, so many people live in doubt of their salvation. It, it, it's rare, it's rare that, it, that a month goes by that somebody don't talk to me about their assurance of their salvation. Now, I understand there can be struggles because of things in our life, but tell, let me tell you, one of the biggest reasons why people struggle is because they don't have a, an obedient mindset to Christ. Look in 1 John chapter 5, verse 2. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do what? And keep His commandments. Now, hang on. We're not done there. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. In other words, we don't, do it, we don't serve him begrudgingly. We serve him because we love him. You wives, how thrilled would you be if your husband came home and says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something special for you. I'm ready. I had to talk myself into it and I got under conviction because the preacher got on to me and, and uh, I'm going to do this and I, my heart's really not in it but that's what I'm supposed to do and I'm going to do it. I know some of y'all think, well, that's an advancement, huh? No, you, 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 you don't want that. You want your husband trying to please you simply because he is still madly in love with you. Amen. 
And that's the way it ought to be with us with God. So many, he said, we love him and we keep his commandments and they're not grievous to us. They're, 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 okay, I'm, I know. I got to go to church and I got to give an offering and I got, no, you don't got to do anything. Matter of fact, you know, if you're doing it because you got to do it, just quit doing it. Fall in love with Jesus, the one who gave his all for you, and see if you don't want to give your all for him. Amen. Commandment is go. You say, but preacher, I can't go overseas. Okay, not missions isn't just overseas. Missions, what about across the street? Did you go to Walmart this week? You can be a missionary. Well, I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize cross-cultural foreign missionaries. Please understand that. There are heroes around here. But we've got the idea that they're missionaries. No, the truth is we are all missionaries. Amen. 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 Can I, Amen. You, want, you want some proof of that? Hold your finger in Matthew. We'll be back there in a minute again. But turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, I can tell you, you can look from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, and you will never find the word missions or missionary. You know what the Bible word for it is? I'm about to read it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and then that well-known verse, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Boy, what a life-transforming verse, right? Look at the next verse. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. Gave who the ministry of reconciliation? Gave us? To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and so hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's the gospel. For now then we are, what's that word? Ambassador. Now we've redefined that word. We call them missionaries. But we who? All believers are doing what? We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. You know what every one of us are? We're missionaries. We're ambassadors. Some of us need to take our ambassadorship seriously. Some of us are a poor representation of God's kingdom and God's government. Amen? Now, I know, I know in recent years we've seen several ambassadors that are unworthy of the title, but we've seen some that certainly bore it well. What about believers? The emphasis, the emphasis of the commission. Go. But look in the back in Mark in Matthew again, verse 28. I mean chapter 28, verse 19. I want you to see not only the emphasis of the commission, but look at the intention of the commission. The intention of the commission. Look at it with me. What's the second word? Now, by the way, it's gonna be a long message if we're doing this a word at a time, huh? What's that second word? Now, I know I've already been pounding that drum, but who, who's he talking to? He's talking to us. Yeah, well, he's talking to the disciples, yes, but he told them to teach them to, everybody else to do the same thing. So he's still talking to you and me. Right. Amen? Amen? Go, because God's word wasn't just to the disciples. God's word was to me as well, right? Amen. So everybody's to go, and who's to do the going? Ye. Now, I know it's Y-E. Now, I know it's probably a very difficult word to understand. Let me translate it for you. Y-O-U, how's that? I'm just trying to get to where all of us are, okay? I want to make certain everybody understands how simple that obeying God and getting the gospel of the world is not a complicated thing. It takes a willingness of God's people to be willing to obey God. Amen? Go ye. That's the intention, to get everybody involved. There is nobody sitting here this morning that is exempt from this. On my computer, I had, and we've passed this out before, it looks really official. It's an official document called the Great Commission Exemption Form. And I said, now, if you feel like you are exempt, just fill this thing out, and then we, this won't apply to you. Because, you know, there is no such thing. Amen. We're all commanded. Ye, go ye. That's the intention. The, the object is ye. What's the reason? Go ye, therefore. Why? Verse 18. 
because he has the power, all power. That word, that Greek word there translated means authority. God has the authority to command me and you. Amen. All power in heaven, all authority and power on earth, it all belongs to him. Hey, what a great privilege. You know, sometimes, especially back in those soldiers who fought in WW2, great, you know, what's been called the greatest generation. Some of them, I've heard some of them talk before and talk. You ought to hear, anybody ever met anybody that served under Patton? Yeah, a couple of you. Boy, it's always an interesting conversation in it. Served under the great General Patton. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen, you get to serve under the great commander-in-chief of everything. He owns it all. It's all his and all authorities in his. And his name is God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You ought to be just as much proud of that as anybody ever served under anybody else. Amen. It ought to bless your soul because you are a child of the king. You belong to him. You've been bought by his blood. He sacrificed it all just for you. If you'd been the only sinner that needed saving, he'd have still saved you. Yeah. Right. Amen. The intention of the commission. Look at the instruction of the commission. Verses 19 and 20. What he's supposed to do. We've heard this outline a million times probably. What are you supposed to go? We're to win them. We're to baptize them. And we're to teach them. Now, when we talk about the intention and the instruction. Let me ask you a question. How many people did Jesus win to, to himself while he was on planet Earth in his three and a half year ministry? We don't have any idea, do we? Oh, we know there's a woman at the well, and there was a crippled man by a pool, and there was a couple of blind men, and there was a couple of lunatics. And what I'm, my point is this Jesus had never taken the modern church growth and evangelism course to where you're supposed to publish your numbers really big. Daddy. My point is, do we want to see crowds saved? Absolutely. But you know where it starts? It starts with the one. Jesus went to one woman at a well. Jesus went to one man at a pool. Now, by the way, an interesting side note here. That man at the pool wasn't the only person there. Yet he only went to that one. Now, why was that? Now, if I can give you some basic evangelism, soul winning, whatever you want to call it, instruction right here. Typical Baptist churches, we teach that you just go out and you pound the doors and you knock every door and you try to give the gospel to everybody that comes to the door and you share the gospel with them and you make sure they pray the prayer. Can I tell you that? Not even Jesus did that. Paul... But he was wrestling about what to do next in Acts 16. He said, well, let's go to Bithynia, guys. And you read Acts 16, he said the Holy Spirit forbade them to go. Were the unbelievers in Bithynia? Absolutely. But they hadn't been prepared yet. They weren't ready to receive the gospel. From there, he said, well, let's go to Asia. And the Holy Spirit said, don't, don't go there either. Were there unbelievers in Asia? Oh, yes, yeah, plenty of them, certainly. That night he went to sleep and said, God, I don't know what to do. And that night he got a vision from a man in Macedonia saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And he went there and planted the gospel and planted a church and it's called the church at Philippi. You see, we need to be so sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Am I trying to say that you, and I know I've heard preachers say, witness it to everybody you come in contact with. I understand that. And I understand that we need to be willing to witness, but not even Jesus did that. Boy, I sound like heresy now, don't I? But not even Jesus witnessed everybody he came in contact with. Neither did Paul. But they were sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and people whose hearts God had already touched. That's the reason why Jesus could go out of his way to go up through Samaria one day and sit down on a well and wait for a woman to come. That's the reason he could do that. Because he knew her heart was ripe and ready. And I've been there when hearts are ripe and ready and they res respond in faith. Can I tell you, it seems like it's getting harder and harder to find those kind of people anymore. We're living in a world that has been so hardened by sin. But yet the gospel still has power. What's the instruction of the commission? First of all, what's that first word? Go ye therefore and do what? Teach. 
the Greek word methetes, make a disciple of them. In other words, win them to Christ. But can I tell you, being a disciple is not just being saved. Now, there are people who will try to tell you that they don't have to be willing to do anything. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're right. But I cannot tell you they will never believe until they are sick of their sin. Called repentance and conviction. Go and make disciples of them. Go teach them. Go baptize them. Well, you teach them, you win them, you baptize them. Can I tell you, especially independent Baptists, we're good on the first part, getting people to make professions of faith. And then if 50% of them get baptized, we're, we're ecstatic, we're happy. Can I tell you, all genuine believers get born again. I mean, get, get, we get baptized. All genuine born again believers. Yeah, all genuine believers get born again. You're right. But all genuine believers get baptized. What kind of salvation experience would get a, or people trusting to get them to heaven when it won't even get them into the baptistry and obedience to Christ? Can I tell you, the moment you lead, help lead, listen, you don't save anybody. And our job isn't, our job isn't, I'm going to say something else, a strong statement. Our job is not to get them saved. Our job is to share the gospel and let the Holy Spirit get them saved. But I'm so thankful when he allows me to be there when he does it. Amen. But once they get saved, that, I, my job isn't over. Your job's not over. We're to explain to them the importance of being baptized and publicly identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then what are we to do? We're to teach them. Now, there's a word teach in verse 19 and a word teach in verse 20. And in English, they both spelled T-E-A-C-H, aren't they? But in the one, the word, the Greek word in verse 19 is methetes, means to make a disciple of, but the word in verse 20 is to teach as in a, it's a we get our word didactic from it, a, a teaching method. But it means to teach them and personally instruct them. Once you lead a convert to Christ, you're to get them baptized, but you're also to be their teacher. What do we want to do today? We want to... We don't mind maybe God allowing us to be there when he does a saving and then we want to bring them to the preacher and say, all right, preacher, you baptize them and teach them. So many believers are, sp are guilty of spiritual abandonment of their children. By the way, I believe that's the reason why I believe, and pardon me, I don't mean to be crude here, but I believe too many believers practice spiritual birth control. They don't want the responsibility of raising the, the converts. So they just don't get involved at all. Because they know with that involvement comes responsibility. When you help lead somebody to Christ, you're responsible for their spiritual welfare. You're to make sure they follow Christ in baptism. You're to begin to teach them how to walk with God. See, there's a problem though. If I don't know how to walk with God, how can I teach somebody else? You understand, you say, what's this all had to do with missions? This sounds like personal soul winning and evangelism. I'm just trying to bring missions back home. Amen. We've got the idea, like I said, that soul winners are God's special forces teams. Missionaries are God's special. No, it's something we're to all do. The Bible word for missionary is what? Ambassador. We represent, we represent a foreign king in a foreign country. <laughs> Amen? Because this world isn't home for us. So we're, we're in a foreign country representing our king. We're ambassadors for Christ. So we see the instruction of the commitment of the commission. But look like lastly at verse 20, at the promise of the commission. What's the promise? He said, if you'll do that, guess what? I'll be with you. Wow. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Boy, I've got God's promise that if I will obey him and get involved in getting the gospel to the world, I will have his unfettered, presence with me at all times. People say, I just know where the Lord is, where God is right now in my life. You know what that means? That means you're not involved in evangelism. You're not involved in getting the gospel into the world. This planet is populated with just over 7 billion people. My, how the world's grown. 
And yet, if you put them all together, over half of them have yet to hear the message that you get to hear every week. You and I have a responsibility. Now, I know, and I don't mean to be mean to anybody. I'm not trying to be unkind, but I know there, there are some that just have no interest in being any more involved than they are. First of all, I would encourage you to ask yourself, am I truly born again? Am I truly saved? I'm not trying to make you doubt your salvation. I'm just trying to help you. Because the Lord said, if you, if you love me, keep my commandments. And God and, and then he said through John, the way we know we're saved is that we keep his commandments and they're not grievous to us. That's the way we know we're saved. If his commandments are grievous, we may not be saved. If you're here today and you're not certain you're saved, that's the first place you need to start is make certain you know you're saved. Amen. But Christians, today, would you come to this altar and say, Lord, help me to be more concerned about the lost of this world. Help me to be willing to do whatever it takes. For some, that may mean that God may want you to go somewhere. Go across the, the nation or go across the sea. Others, God just wants you to get involved with everything you can right here. And, and give. You don't have to give a lot. Listen, over the years past here at church, you'll see tonight, we've given some incredible offerings to missions over the years. Given almost uh, $650,000 to missions the past 14 years here. But you know how it happened? It's because people got committed to making certain everybody got to hear what they already had. It takes it for that. I'm not here to tell you how much to give. That's between you and God. And this message is not about the giving part of it, but it does take giving. Amen? Amen. We can't send missionaries overseas. Right. We can't even do the local. We want to help the needy here. We can't help. It takes money. But that, uh, you know what? The money would be no problem once God gets our heart. And if we would just yield ourselves to him and say, God, make me willing. Make me willing. To be a servant for you and be used to share the gospel whether it's across the street or around the world. Help me to be like C.T. Studd that the pastor read about a while ago who heard that comment by an atheist. If I believe what religion believes, I would give it all up to make certain one person gets saved. If an atheist sees it, why not us? Let's bow our heads. In a moment, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. We're going to sing one we've been singing quite frequently here. Without him, I could do nothing. But you have to understand, without him, people die and go to hell. Without him, people die and go to a Christless, a tormenting eternity in the lake of fire. And that could be prevented if we will just make certain they get exposed to the gospel. We know not everybody's going to be saved. Matter of fact, Jesus said there's going to be few. But let's help make the few a little bigger. Father, you know the need of hearts. Pray you'd have your way this time of decision and invitation now. In Jesus' precious name we ask these things. Amen. Let's stand as we begin to.